Welcome to another episode of the Giants Little Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. I am John Schmelk, and this is the third or fourth straight year we've had him on the show to talk about the NFL draft. He is Matt Maticharian, former NFL scout. And Matt, tell the folks what you're doing now, who you're working for, your collaboration with the 33rd team. Yeah, I'm working for SIS, uh, Sports Info Solutions. Uh, been here seven to eight years now. But basically, uh, we put to get we work with NFL teams. We provide them information throughout the year and leading up to the draft. And a lot of that same information, obviously not as in full detail uh, as you'll get on the team side, but that's available on the 33rd team dot com. Uh, you can check out basically their whole draft experience is based on our evaluations, which are based on two things. Number one, my background as a scout and, and the whole crew, we have years and years of scouting experience collectively now. Uh, going through NFL style scouting reports. And then the other part, some of the really interesting data and metrics that we, that we bring to the picture. What are some of the, uh, you know, I'll save that for, for position. So why don't, why don't we dive right into this then? And everyone wants to start with quarterback. I don't want to lose my mind on it because I've done a bunch of quarterback spots this week, but what are some of the important metrics that you guys have been able to quantify from the college game, which can be so different then the pro game. We had Kurt Warner on earlier in the week. He told us that how, look, these are like, it's almost two different sports. These guys are being asked to play in the quarterback position. So what are some of the metrics you look for a quarterback that you think are predictive for an NFL success in college to carry on to the pros? Yeah. Um, it's a loaded question. And, uh, Oh yeah, I know it is. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, you no, no, it's good. Uh, quarterbacks are hard. And, uh, in terms of the traits that we look for, for quarterbacks, definitely accuracy, uh, is, is the leader of the pack. Uh, but also on top of that, you look for uh, leadership, you look for clutch performance, you look for the ability to work through your progressions, you look for arm strength, athleticism, all these things kind of add up into the pie. Uh, you know, I think you're absolutely right that uh, you can get fooled a little bit by some of these college offenses, right? You think back to Zach Wilson and him just playing uh, really with no pressure whatsoever. It was almost like Reggie Bush at USC, um, and it's not super surprising to see, in my opinion, that he hasn't been able to handle kind of the live bullets in the NFL uh, the way you might have hoped. Um, so you got to look at, it, at at all the things together and you got to take it in context and you got to give your best shot. Now, the things that um, we find that are predictive are actually sort of interesting and unexpected. So you might have heard people say on the NFL, in the NFL level, uh, quarterback, their performance in a clean pocket is more predictive than their performance when under pressure. But when you look at college, you actually almost want to look at it exactly the opposite way. When we're projecting not from one NFL season to another NFL season, but we're projecting from college to the pros, we actually find that you get a lot of really good signal from what happens when the quarterback is playing under pressure. Now, beyond that, all pressures are not created equal. So you want to have an understanding of that too. So how often are you creating pressure? How much of it is on your offensive line because they're blowing blocks? How much of it is because you're holding the ball? So a couple of the contextual metrics that I really like that you can find on the 33rdteam.com for quarterbacks are in the rushing and timing section for quarterbacks. So if you pull up Caleb Williams, you can see his throw time, throw air time plus minus, and his snap to throw plus minus. So what are these snap to throw plus minus? is based on the type of drop back that you had, based on everything that we know about the play. Was it first and 10? Was it third and one? All this kind of stuff. We have an expected time to throw that we have based on your drop type. And then we can look at how you either took longer to throw or you got the ball out of your hands more quickly than that. Uh, Caleb Williams would be a guy that would have a high positive snap to throw time, which is to say he tends to hold on to the ball a bit more. So, Again, it's not going to tell you, is this going to be a good quarterback or a bad quarterback? But it'll tell you a little bit about what you're dealing with here. When you have quarterbacks that hold on to the ball longer, then we can say with, with relative uh, predictive, uh, I'm not going to say certainty, but accuracy, that you will carry that trait with you into the NFL. Russell Wilson was always going to be somebody who held on to the ball a long time. He was going to get sacked a little more because of that, but also have some of the big plays. Uh, that's one of the metrics that I really like there. The throw arm time, uh, the throw air time, it does the same thing. It looks at the average deep out, the average uh, bang eight, whatever, whatever route you're throwing. It's adjusting for how far down the field you're throwing it. 
and what type of route it was and saying how long did it take for the ball to get there. So that's really an arm strength measure. So that's another one where um, guys that can really zip it, you don't really see that being something that you learn in the NFL. Uh, you know, your Kenny Pickett's, your your Desmond Ritters, the guys that don't have your Justin Justin Herbert uh, type arms. Uh, these are the guys that it, that shows up for them. So really just nitty gritty stuff that allows you not to just have one number that's going to tell you if the guy's going to be good or not, because that's unrealistic, but to understand exactly what you're getting and be able to understand all the specifics of it. I think that's where the numbers really help. All right. So you guys have Williams as your number one quarterback. May is your second relatively close in their rankings and their grades. You have Williams as a seven may is a 6.8. So not that far away. They're both towards the top of your board. Then you have a bit of a gap down to Jaden Williams, Jaden Daniels, pardon me, who's your 25th ranked player. Why the gap between May and Daniels is wide as it is when you take a look at what Daniels did at LSU. Yeah. So um, in one sense, um, it's, it's the grading scale at work and based on the criteria uh, of, of the way that we we put together our scale, that's going to dictate a lot of the a lot of the grades and how that works right there. So really, when we talk about you know Caleb, that seven point oh type grade player, that's the type of player. If you have a quarterback like that, we're talking about somebody who's going to be the number one pick every year. Right, Drake May at a six point eight. So that six point seven to six point nine range on our scale. These are our very good starters in the NFL. These are the starters that are the reason why we win games. Maybe not a first year Pro Bowler. But 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 really strong parts of your team. We see May at, as that 6.8, which no matter what grades you have on other players, that's basically, unless you have a 7.0 type quarterback, that's going to mean that you're basically our second pick, right? Guys can have higher grades without being ranked as highly. So that's where it gets a little bit tricky. Right. Um, but what ends up happening on our board is we had a lot of players in the 6.8 range and in the 6.7 range. Um, and uh, May was really at the top end of the of the 6.8s. And Daniels was closer to the lower end of the six sevens. All that that's really saying there is we have more confidence in the projection for Drake May. Again, you look at what he's demonstrated on film combined with the fact that he's a bit of a younger prospect combined with the traits and the traits like a Justin Herbert. Like when you look at Drake May, you talk about size, you talk about arm strength, you talk about deep accuracy, you talk about athleticism. Um, this is, this is somebody who has every tool in his belt, um, just not not as demonstrated and not as uh, kind of special and and uh, supernatural as you see with Caleb Williams sometimes. Um, Daniels, I think he's a one or two read quarterback and then he can run with it. I certainly think he's a much better prospect than like a Malik Willis. You can play with this quarterback oh, yeah, on your yeah. team in the NFL. This is not what we're talking about there. But, but um, I don't see the high level uh, arm talent um, and I don't see kind of the upside that you have with those first two guys as it pertains to, to Daniels. The other thing too, you know, he's been in college for a while. He's had ups and downs this, this past season, you couldn't have imagined a better offensive situation to be in. Right. So going back to what I said before about uh, Zach Wilson and how that can be tricky. I think you're looking at some great receivers. You're looking at probably two first round tackles next year on that offense. There were a lot of things that, that made that a nice, a nice situation for him. No, 100% agree with you. Um, I'm with you. And I basically see those three guys the exact same way, by the way. So we're on the exact same page on those three guys. And I think our evaluation is very similar. Now, we drop all the way down to your 6-4 on your scale, which is the higher end of the limited starter or multi-positional backup group. So I imagine in the NFL, this is probably what you would consider probably a lower end starting quarterback, somewhere in the 15 to maybe 20 to 30 range or so. Uh, and you have Penix and McCarthy both in that group. What is it about those two guys where some people have McCarthy as a top 10? Some people really like Penix as a top 15 guy. Why are you guys not as high on those two quarterbacks? Well, I mean, they might get pushed up the boards. These are quarterbacks, right? I just said, and May might be a 6.8, but he would be the second player that, you know, if, if, if SIS was drafting, he'd probably be the second player off the board. Of course. Uh, you know, you have a hard time passing on that Marvin Harrison Jr., but uh, that would be fun. That'd be a fun little decision to have. Um these these are guys like you said they're a little bit more limited starters to to um kind of high quality backups guys that if you have them as your quarterback you might be looking to replace them that's sort of the grain range that where these we see these quarterbacks uh by their second year in the league um McCarthy's been the one that hasn't surprised me at all that we've seen him really shoot up the charts 
because we really do our evaluations off of film. And based off of the film, I don't see how you could come up any higher than, than a 6.4 type grade. Um, I, I just don't think it's been demonstrated. But the things that you're going to see with McCarthy, he's young. Uh, so the upside's there. Apparently, everybody that puts him on the board and has a chance to, to engage with him and from a leader, all that kind of stuff, people have the opportunity to fall in love with him. And if you really need a quarterback and you know that those first three are kind of unrealistic for you, or in my opinion, even more so the first two, um, I can see how teams might fall in love with him. I can see how a Minnesota Vikings would be there saying, OK, we have the right infrastructure to bring this sort of a player in and we can get uh, Kirk Cousins light for a rookie contract and and play like that. I can see that sort of stuff. And I and I don't want to bet against him because he's young and he's got a lot of the tools for the upside. I just haven't seen it yet. So that's what separates him from those other guys for me. Uh, Penix is almost the opposite side of, this, of, of the same coin. He's old and he's got an injury history. Um, but everything he put on film this last year was everything that you'd want to see. Um, things that I don't love about him. Uh, I think that his release is a little bit janky. I usually don't get too concerned about what it sort of looks like when players throw the ball. I care about where the ball goes. And he's got great deep accuracy. There's no sliding that. Uh, but I do get concerned sometimes because I think it gets elongated. And I don't think it's a it's a clean, repeatable motion every time that we sort of see from him. Um, he definitely surprised with some of the athletic testing. That was better than I expected that he would do. Um, but even so, if you're going to go for a Penix, um, in this case, you might you might feel comfortable with what you're getting right off the bat. But I do think that there's uh, a little bit of concern on the medical front, which which obviously I don't have the you know the behind the scenes insight on, um, and then a little bit on the age front because you've got to understand that that this is a player that's that's going to have less upside for development than than a McCarthy or than a May. Fair. Let's go to wide receiver here, Matt. And you have your top three the same way I do. Harrison and Neighbors right at the top, neck and neck. You have a Dunze right below them. Awesome category, just a little step below. I see him the same way. I want to go into your next group. This is your six, seven groups. This is a high-level starter group. And you have Brian Thomas Jr. there. But you also have Keon Coleman there. And I'm curious, what sets Keon Coleman apart for you guys? Are there metrics that jump out to you? Because I got to be honest, when I watch him, I don't see the level of separation that I need to see on a consistent basis for him to be ranked this high on my personal board. Yeah. You might get a little bit of a Kelvin Benjamin deja vu uh, watching him a little bit, a little uh, bit, a little Benjamin, maybe a little uh, Lacan Treadwell, if you want to go that far, maybe. Yeah. So I I'm with you there. I don't see a guy that's got, obviously he doesn't have great speed. He has good speed, not great speed. Um, I'm not so concerned about the testing and that, that sort of stuff. Um, don't see somebody who's a great route runner, somebody who's, separating uh, super consistently, like you said. But I really like this player as an athlete, not not just as a speed, not like the speed, the separator, but the athleticism. I think when you watch this guy play, you see his ability to use his physicality along with his movement skills, along with kind of just being a baller that, that knows how to go out there, win at the catch point, get the ball into the end zone. Um, I, I see him as somebody who, if you're looking for that take the top off the defense role, that's not your guy right here. But if you're looking for somebody who's more like one of these 49ers receivers, somebody who can come in, do the dirty work, but then also provide some explosiveness to your offense with the ball in his hands, with the with the run after catch ability that, that we really like to see, that, that's what excites me most uh, about, about Coleman. Um, I, I, I have a question. I got one for you. The way you just described them, what do you think of the um, Michael Thomas from the Saints comp? Yeah, I, I can see that sort of thing. I think there's a little bit more. Uh, no, yeah, I think that's a fair comparison. Um, I I don't see this player as being uh, as good as as peak Michael Thomas. I think that you know we'd be talking about him in an even higher grade if that were of the course. case. But but some of that skill set, yeah, some of that uh, dirty work ability, um, some of this stuff that um, a, a, a Gabe Davis gets involved in your offense and has the capability to do. Um, I mentioned the Niners wide receivers. I think of Robert Woods. Um, so I see this guy as really the Z uh, in, in terms of your, you know, if you're running a West Coast, you have your X, Y, Z. Um, this would be your flanker receiver. This wouldn't be your guy that you necessarily just want lined up solo against the best corner on the other team. I think he can do a little bit of that, but I think where this player gets more exciting is involving him more in, in the action of your offense and, and that sort of a thing. 
you love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows, your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? That makes sense. I was surprised when I took a look at your draft board. And by the way, they have a, a big board on, on the website, the 33rd team. Excuse me. They also have um, a horizontal and vertical draft board, which I love because it shows kind of where they stack in terms of positions. And then they relate it back to the other group. And I, I think it's a fantastic layout that that's out there. You guys really need to go check that out. Um, and again, all that's based on the SIS scouting process. Are you maybe you think a little bit lower on the second part of this receiver group than other people? Because you don't have anybody in that low end starter group from the six, five to six, six grade on your scale, but you are stacking up 12 of them in your limited starter group. So I was surprised maybe some of those guys didn't get pushed up into that, you know, lower end starter group in, in, in that six, five, six, six range. Yeah. I think that's a great question. Um, the scale is rigid when it comes to what we can do in terms of are you a two or are you a three in terms of a wide receiver. So if we believe that you're a legitimate number one or number two starting wide receiver on a Super Bowl caliber caliber team, you'll be at that six, seven range or above, right? That's what we're saying about Keon Coleman. If he's your two, you can compete for a Super Bowl. The rest of these guys, we feel like are more number threes. They're more guys that for us, that would mean you're – basically a starter level, right? We know that most teams play 11 personnel most of the time. Sure. You're basically a starter level, but you're probably a little bit limited in terms of being either ideally an inside guy or ideally an outside guy, as opposed to we like the six, seven and above grades to be able to do both. Mm. So that's one of the things that's going on there. The other thing is the horizontal board does a great job because if you're in a draft room, you see the horizontal board and otherwise you're just looking at whatever Kuiper has on TV and stuff like that. And it's more of just like a list of players and then separated out by position. But if you can see the texture, every single draft room I've ever been in, you have a lot of receivers and you have a lot of running backs on the board. It just has to do with, with the types of athletes that exist on this earth. Um, it's just, you get more people that are 200 to 220 pounds than that are 320 pounds and athletic. So offensive line is always something where I'm looking at, especially a tackle where you got to get them earlier. You're not going to get them. You're not going to find starting caliber players past day two, Heck, sometimes past day one. Now, what you notice when you look at the horizontal board this year, which allows you to see kind of the vertical and, and horizontal, how everything compares. We have a, a class of offensive tackles that I've never seen before. Yeah. You see tons of those guys to the point where I can see 10 guys going on the first day. And, and that wouldn't surprise me in terms of offensive linemen. But also that's because in the league right now, we still have scarcity at that position. There might be a lot this year, but generally there's scarcity. In the NFL, we've had so many good receivers come into the NFL right away. Right? Do you remember like 10 years ago, we used to say uh, it's going to take until at least their third year for wide receivers to really get it. Not with, anymore. Not anymore. If you walk into the league, you're Jamar Chase, right? Like that, that's what we're looking for now. So um, because of that, I think it's even harder to earn a six, seven and above grade as a receiver on uh, in today's NFL. I think because the talent's gotten so good there, we're always comparing these players to what they're going to be in the NFL. Basically what we're saying is all of these guys that we've got in that number three range, we don't really think they're better than the 64th best receiver in the league or, or somewhere around that range. Um, so that's, I think part of it is as there continue to be more and more, not just receivers, but also really good receivers it becomes even harder to earn one of those really high grades as a receiver year over year over year. And that's just the, the development of it. Yeah. I've never heard it put that way before. I think that's interesting. So basically the grading scale has almost been inflated a little bit, right? Where you have to hit a higher standard to be considered a low end starter because there are so many quality wide receivers in the league. I, I, I think that's interesting. I never thought about it that way. I think that's a good way to look at it. You mentioned the offensive tackle class. You have Joe Alt at the top. I'm not surprised. I love the fact that you have Latham as as your second guy, to be honest with you. I think you watch his tape. He just uses those long arms to lock guys out, and he just vice grips them, and they can't go anywhere. Uh, you have Fashionu there. You have Fuanga, Guyton. I want to lock in on the Guyton part of this, because I do feel like he's a little raw, Matt, 
And I wonder if I would have him closer to the Mims Suamatia group, just because I feel like he needs a lot of work with his hands, even though athletically, I mean, he might be the most athletic guy in this whole class at offensive tackle with the way he moves his feet. Yeah. Uh, you know, we're splitting hairs a little bit here. We're at the six, seven grade versus right. the, the six, six grade. Um, I think um, the consistency is definitely a concern there. The athletic upside is, abs is absolutely ridiculous. The play strength is, is, is uh, really strong. You, you mentioned uh, Kingsley. I'm not even going to try to say his last name. Sua Matia. Sua Matia, uh, I believe. Su Sua Matia, um, or as we like to call him, Panay Sewell's cousin. <laughs> uh, um, he's another guy. He's another guy. Three years in college. Absolutely ridiculous. Like Panay Sewell athletic traits. Like not not even exaggerating. He's got very similar. Um, and but, he's also a nasty son of a gun, by the way. He is the exact type of like prototype personality you would want to see out there playing. Like, he buries people on run plays. He, he, yeah, when he hits him, he buries him. Unfortunately, he misses a lot too. Yeah, that's correct. And that's what I wanted that's to get correct. back to is the, the inconsistency with both of these players is the only thing keeping them from being elite, elite prospects. If these guys had put it together at this point, uh, I'm with you. So, you know, we have a, a slight edge to Guyton over, over Kingsley. Um, you know, I, 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 I was concerned about things with both of them and also incredibly excited. And it's, it's one of these things where, you feel like you're between a rock and a hard place when you're right in their grade uh, because because it could go either way. It really could. No, and it's hard. And I, I, I've I've done boards the last few years, Matt. I've never actually done like numerical grades on each guy. I've tried to start doing it this year. It's hard mm -hmm. to, to try to parse. And I, I believe, believe it or not, I use the same scale that Lanzier line uses for NFL.com, which is very similar mm -hmm. to what your scale is in terms of where these guys land and just – differentiating like oh six eight seven versus six eight four it's 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 a very very tough exercise just just so fans understand how tough this is to do and parse these guys and just understanding what you value more than other things it's hard mims i think he's fascinating not a lot of tape hasn't played a lot of football but my gosh the tape he has try to help me find the bad pass pro set with this guy because i don't know if it's out there it's phenomenal but there's just not a lot of experience there's an injury history I mean, would it surprise me if in two years a Marius Mims is the best offensive tackle in this class? It wouldn't, to be quite honest with you. Uh, yeah, another absolute mammoth giant. Um, I get a little bit more worried about, about uh, the athleticism here. Um, I see somebody who's powerful, who's a finisher, all that kind of stuff. Um, and and like the, the arm length is, is ridiculous. It's like his stretch Armstrong type, type arm length uh, when it comes to him. Um, so... I'm with you in seeing the the upside with him. Where I worry is more more the reactive athleticism. Like if this is going to be a good NFL player, he'll have to be a little bit more like a, a Morgan Moses type in terms of like it's never going to look super pretty when he's moving around out there. Right. But God bless you if you can get around this guy. You know what I mean? Like so, um, man, I think Alt is a special, special prospect. That's the only reason why it would surprise me if he was the best tackle in in this group. But, you know, short of that, you know, it's kind of like when you talk about Marvin Harrison Jr. It's like, yeah, Neighbors is an unbelievable receiver prospect. There's just this guy who's the best receiver prospect in 20 years who's coming out in the same year, you know? So you have all, like, he would be ahead of Sewell. He would be ahead of Andrew Thomas. He'd be ahead of, um, I'm trying to think of what some of the right, other great Right in that are. range. Unfortunately, I wrote up Evan Neal, and I thought he would be a good NFL player. He'd, he'd be right in the range of of that area, too. Matt, so did I. I mean, I, I think all of us are kind of surprised that Neil struggled the way he has, to be honest with you. So hopefully he'll be able to turn that. He's remember, he's only played in 22 NFL games. Hopefully he'll have the opportunity to, to uh, turn things around there. All right. So that, that's go on great. the Andrew Thomas track. Whatever, whatever flip from year one to year two for Andrew Thomas, let's get that in year two to year three. Nah, I, I, dude, I'm with you 100%. Why do you have Fatanu as a guard center instead of an offensive tackle? Because all the measurements, the testing, the performance, frankly, at Washington, tell me that he should be able to play offensive tackle in the pros. Yeah, so for us, it's not a matter of we think you can only do this or you can only do that. Um, we see him as somebody who could uh, potentially play guard or tackle on the NFL level. I think um, what we try to do is we try to put you at what we think your best position is. Got it. And so, so really, we think that's where he would be at his best. And it's, it's worth remembering, too, that uh, 
it's not like tackle is uh, point blank more valuable than guards the way that it was a few years ago in the NFL. Depending on where you go, depending on if you have some of these shorter, more athletic quarterbacks, having that strength up the middle has become kind of a common way to build things and, and a smart way to build things. You know, look at uh, the Chiefs, for example. That's where it really where they're strong is right is right up that center group. Um, it's the old Drew Brees coming from my New Orleans days, having the two really good guards to make sure that you were keeping the pocket where it needs to be. Uh, so for that reason, having somebody that can handle the things that move around really quickly on the inside, not have to reset, not have to to um, always be um, kind of uh, in a deep set, but also the ability to short set people, all that kind of stuff. Um, I like the the variety that he plays with. I like the athleticism that he plays with. And I, it's for me, it's not one of these guys that, ah, he doesn't have what it takes to be a tackle. Let's just move him inside. He's one of these guys who I'm like, man, I think he's really special as a guard and could also play tackle. Maybe, maybe like Tyler Smith, when you look about out, out in Dallas, like that that sort of archetype. That makes sense. All right, let, 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 let's dig here a little bit um, into day two. Uh, because the Giants have some positions of need where it looks like you have some pretty good depth there for them to hit. But first, a reminder, the Giants huddle is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. From game day to every day, Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Um, so let's take a look here, Matt, at day two guards. Since we're on the offensive line, let's start there first. You have a pretty thick group here, uh, assuming Barton slides into to, to round one. You got guys like Dominic Pooney, uh, Zach Frazier, who's probably more of a center, Christian Haynes from UConn, uh, Bo Limmer, more of a center from Arkansas, Christian Mahogany, Boston College, Hunter Norzad from Penn State. You have a pretty thick group here if you want to try to pick up a guard in round two or three, it looks like. Yeah, I think that the nature of the way that the the uh, linemen uh, being just so such a great year this year, the way that it's shaped out is a lot of the teams that are looking for those bookend tackles – they're going to be looking at some of those guys that we talked up, talked about, you know, in the first round and what you're going to end up with, you know, even if you have the 10 guys go in the first round, there are still going to be players that are going to be there uh, in the second and third round. Um, so it's really exciting as a scout because going back to before, right. You can imagine most years you get to, to day three and it's a lot of running backs and receivers and not a lot of the, you know, the, the tackles and corners and and some of those building block positions this year, you're going to get there on the second day and you're going to say, wow, there are people that we like to start that we can get not just in the second round, but potentially in the third round. So I, I think it just has to do with how things shook out this year and the amount of depth that there really is at that position. Um, for me, I, I, I sometimes picture if I was in a, with a team right now, I would have a hard time not drafting like linemen, 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 yeah, uh, in certain situations here. No, I'm with you. Any metrics before we move on from the offensive linemen that you guys have, whether it's pressure rate allowed or any other customized things you guys have come up with that you find can be predictive for an offensive lineman and his success moving forward? So we rolled out a new offensive line scouting data collection this year. And what that meant was we basically split the split the gap in between our normal scouting operation, which is very much based on how, how teams operate and, you know, individuals watching film and following a grading scale. Um, we kind of split that and merged it with what, what we're really known for and what we, what we more work with the teams on, which is our objective data collection of all the things that are happening on the field. And what we came up with is something where for every snap that the top 10 offensive linemen in this year's draft played, we looked at every snap, this year and last year, the last two years of film. And as opposed to just looking at were they successful, unsuccessful, these sorts of things, we were able to look further and understand what skills they were displaying as they were playing on film. So we might talk about athletic ability and upper body strength and reactive athleticism. Well, we actually charted those things across two seasons for each of these players. Wow. And without getting, you know, too far into you know into the details but like you'll see some things that you might have expected right like you mentioned to Graham Barton before what what jumped out when you look at his numbers wasn't oh he's great oh he's terrible it was this is a power player this is a guy to draft if you want him to play on the interior if you want to run duo if you want to run power and you want to really mash people 
you get him on a double team. We never saw anybody, you know, with a, with a higher rate out of out of the whole cohort. Um, the most power on display. But wow. what you saw was somebody who also struggles with with deep sets, um, struggles with the wide sets, um, and makes you say, okay, I'm I'm not very comfortable with playing him at tackle on the NFL level. Um, and if we're looking for somebody who's going to be a you know a great space athlete, this isn't the guy that has that makeup. So you can learn not just quality, but a little bit more about the flavor, which I really like there. Um, and in terms of quality, uh, go back to Latham. Part of the reason why we like him so much, he really, really jumped out in terms of when you looked on a snap by snap basis, the, the amount of good traits that he displayed on a down in and down out basis compared to his peers. And then the amount of bad traits that he displayed, it was more goods and fewer bads. So um, we really like that. Now that's just talking about the performance right now, not the projection, but um, it, it speaks to, I think, part of my comfort with having a really high grade on Latham there. Nah, I love that. And then I know we've talked about like yards per route run and stuff like that. Anything new with receivers that you guys have kind of ginned up in the lab? Oh, we've got all sorts of stuff. Uh, it, it's hard to even uh, remember what's come out since when. Um, in terms of the receiver stuff, um, one thing that I really like is our, is our targets above expectation metric. This, you know, beware because it can be influenced by who your teammates are, right? Just like any target share metric might have to do with this. But this basically looks at based on what routes you were being out to run, asked to run, and how often we would expect players to be running those routes within the concepts that they're that they're actually playing how often they would be targeted. And it looks at which players are earning more or fewer targets than we would expect based on that. And one thing that we really like, again, you asked about predictiveness, predictive from college to pro, the guys that get the ball that earn the targets, they tend to earn the targets. So um, that's one of them there where we can compare uh, your ability to basically get the ball thrown your way, um, which is a proxy for openness and, but also takes into account uh, some of your, your radius and all that kind of stuff. Do you have that on, on the website or is that one of those proprietary team data is that we, that, 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 that we can't quite get our heads on yet? Oh, I'd have to, you know, sometimes I can't remember which ones we have on the website and which ones are in other places. That one might not be up there, but uh, I can take a peek um, just to let you know. Yeah. Yeah. No worries. Absolutely. All right. Let's uh let, let's continue with some of those second okay, so round targets. If you look at targets and hands, it's, it'd be the, TGT uh, percent plus minus. Oh, I see it. Got it. So that's that's percentage of time that you're earning targets relative to what we would expect. Folks, and again, go to the 33rd team to check out the draft board. You click on the individual player, click on stats, and then you can kind of sort through all these proprietary SIS numbers, which are just wonderful and fantastic. Join me, Matt Medicharian, giving us a lot of time here. We really appreciate it, Matt. I know you're busy, uh, but just phenomenal stuff uh, talking about the NFL draft. Let's stick, go to defense and go to corner here because I think the Giants have a real need for corner in the second round. And again, you have seven guys in the 6'6 six, six to 6'5 six, range, which are low-end starters, um, which I think is interesting. And you have Terry and Arnold, a lot of people, and Cooper DeGene, a lot of people have his corner ones um, in this draft as first-round guys. You have them pushed down a little bit. Uh, but what stands out from this group, uh, either player-wise or performance-wise, that you think could be appealing to a team like the Giants that need a corner on day two of the draft? So the, the corners this year are interesting. Uh, not, I don't think, the sort of top, top end um, guys that, that that really weren't top 10 pick, that sort of thing. And as we've seen with corners, not just in the college ranks, but even in the NFL ranks, you know, a lot of more money going to the defensive line players and the pass rushes in the past couple of years and I think the reason for that is because we can predict how they're going to perform a little bit better than we can with corners. Corners, you'll see players, you know, Xavier Howard seemed like he was the best player in the league, and all of a sudden he's he's out of a job, and we don't even know uh, what to make of him. So uh, it's the nature of the position that it can be sort of volatile um, if you're getting the interceptions, if you're getting burned, all that kind of stuff. Um, so we don't see top-end guys here, but – we do see uh, some players that basically you can pick your wart and you'll find some guys that can, that can play, that can be starting caliber players on your defense, but you might have to deal with something that, that is less than ideal uh, depending on who you're looking at. Um, you know, I take, for example, um, the example of, of Rakestraw. 
Um, he's a guy that I really like that I think can play well, but you know, people have concerns about the top end speed. Uh, you combine the speed with the, with the lack of size that he has. Um, and you, and you can, you have to be really more looking for somebody with elite cover skills rather than somebody who maybe would be more well-rounded to fit into a zone scheme and can rally to make tackles and all that sort of stuff. So, you know, McKinstry may be the opposite of that, right? A nice, big, strong guy. Um, but um, there are people that have certainly had their questions about him based on the film and how, and how things progress throughout the year. So I think that the, the sort of, we like McKinstry a little bit better than Arnold. Uh, most people probably have it the other way. We're a little lower on DeGene than some people. Uh, other people like him higher. I think it has to do with, number one, uh, an acknowledgement that, that corners are harder to predict than uh, some of these other defensive players. Um, and number two, um, that I don't think that there's there's uh, players here really that that you just, yeah, Devin Witherspoon, lock him up. No, no problem about it. You're right. going to be able to find a wart with any of these guys. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? Question on Wiggins. You know, he's so light in the butt, but I think for me, if you're going to, if there's one guy in this class that if, you know, a game's on the line and the new overtime rules is a one, one-on-one -on -one rep with against a wide receiver and a DB in this class, I think I'm picking Wiggins to cover that wide receiver. I think that's how good his coverage goes are, but he's so light. Anything you guys have been able to figure out in how that lack of size might impact a player in terms of metrics or things you've been able to look for in college where that comes into play with how they play and it's not just a number on a sheet of paper? Absolutely. Um, the arm length is is probably the most concerning measurement that I look at with him. It's a 30 and a half inch arms. And uh, now listen, this is probably going to be uh, maybe the top corner that goes in the draft and and a, a really strong player that, that I'd be comfortable with. Um, but when you have somebody that just physically uh, doesn't have the arm length to be able to, to battle with an NFL size wide receiver at the line of scrimmage, it's going to eliminate a lot of your ability to play press. Mm. Uh, there are going to be guys that you just can't do it against in a way that you'd really like to. So I love the, the, the cover ability. I love athleticism, the transition, all of that kind of stuff, but it's exactly the things that you would expect when you've got somebody who's lighter and smaller, you, you're going to, you're not going to expect as much from them in run support, but what we've found and, and what we always keep coming back to is we don't pay corners to support the run. Think about Deion Sanders, right? Nobody ever paid Deion to make a tackle on anybody. I'm not trying to say that, that physicality is not important and all this kind of stuff, but um, really if you're going to draft people high at this position, it's got to be people with really special athletic traits that can run, that can stick in coverage um, and, and have this kind of special athleticism. So for me, the one thing that we've found when we've sort of split up the archetypes is as much as, as good football people who want to make the, the coaches that coached us when we were kids happy and all that kind of stuff, we kind of have to not care about <laughs> whether or not corners can tackle when we're really trying to figure out who's going to be a great NFL player. I love the honest answer. That's fantastic. Defensive tackle is another spot where I think the Giants could be in the neighborhood in, in round two or three here. Matt, and you guys have five defensive tackles in that kind of second tier, and I think Devondre Sweat will probably be available in the second round too. One, he's the other end of the spectrum, right? Weight fluctuations and stuff, that's something that worries me. But then you got a nice little group of, of defensive tackles here with like different skill sets, in my opinion, that could help a team on day two. Yeah, uh, I, I kind of love Tavondre Sweat. Uh, he's one of my favorite players. Um, man, they would be eating up a lot of space if you had <laughs> you had him in there on the on the Giants defensive line. Um, but he's a player that doesn't have the crazy pass rush juice. So um, I think with Sweat, you would be looking at somebody who you would want to have basically making plays behind the line of scrimmage on first and second down a little bit more. Really disruptive run game player. Obviously, he's going to be a handful in, in a pass rush just because he's such a, a big, strong guy. Uh, but like you said, uh, some of the weight fluctuations, I wouldn't count on him to really be a, an every down pass rusher. So that's a little bit more the flavor you get uh, with somebody like him. 
meanwhile, uh, you look at his teammate, Byron Murphy, I think you're talking about a little bit more uh, that pass rush, that that one gap and go, uh, that type of player. So um, Dallas Turner probably uh, going to be the top uh, player taken as far as the edges go. But um, I look at some of these some of these defensive tackles and I get I get as excited about them as, as any of these other guys when you get into that next tier. Absolutely. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. Named a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by The Banker as the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle. Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. Two more spots. Matt, safety. I would not be surprised if you don't see a safety picked in this class until midway through the second round. Um, but you do have a couple guys that you have first round grades on and Tyler Newman and, and Cam Kitchens. Why do you like those two guys too much? And then it looks like that next group for you guys, are you even looking at day three grades on, on, on those guys with the 6.4? Or do you think those guys could, can slip into round three? Yeah. So our grading scale is never going to be predicated on, on where we think they're going to go round wise. We're always yep. looking at what role we think you can play on the team. So, so we saw Newman and, and Kitchens, as guys that we think can be low-end starters in the NFL, they're probably not ideally the best safety on your team. But if they're one of your two starting safeties, we think that you you can compete for a Super Bowl with these guys. Um, the big separator with those two compared to the guys that that bump down a little bit more into that 6'4 range, which I think uh, there'll be a mix of day two and day three from the guys in that range If I if I had to kind of guess how things will play out. Separation for us is really the three-level ability, whereas – we, we need to make sure that we have guys that can play truly on the back end can split the field and cover two. Um, and then also they can play in the intermediate level that they can man up on a running back or on a tight end. And then also be able to come down into the box on run support. If, if you're doing two of the three, that's usually what's going to separate you into that second tier for us relative to the guys that we really feel like have that versatility. Um, like you say, though, unless you get the Kyle Hamilton types, safeties don't tend to go. Uh, teams just aren't, aren't prioritizing that in the draft. Have you guys thought about almost separating these, as you mentioned, the guys that you have ranked highest is because they can do all three things. Well, then you get into the next group and you have some guys, all right, well, he's more of a slot corner safety. He's more of a box strong safety. He's more of a split safety. He's more of a single high center fielder. How do you kind of, when you put this together with your metrics and your board, how do you kind of split up these mm -hmm. safety roles because they really are distinct roles a lot of times in terms of what you're going to ask these guys to do. And if you're using yeah. them in the ideal way, it's so funny because when I was first coming up as a scout, we had strong safeties and free safeties. Yeah. Right. Like it was like, are you, are you a box safety? That's basically a glorified linebacker or are you playing cover one and you center fielder all the time. And it was like apples and oranges, right. Over the course of time, it's really moved in towards we need two, sometimes three, uh, to be able to play because not because we need to have a box guy and we need to have a deep guy. Certainly we saw, you know, the camp chancellor still have success with that sort of thing. But at this point, it's passing league, like we said before about corners that can't tackle, and we need safeties that can cover. These are secondary players. So the way that we look at it is um, – we do less separation in terms of, are you a free safety? Are you a strong safety these days? And we do more kind of figuring out what skills you have and how many of them you have. And your versatility is going to be directly correlated to your grade as a result of that. So 7-0 and above, the, the Pro Bowl types, the Kyle Hamiltons of the world, I actually really don't care if he can play on the back end or not. He's not going to play back there. We know exactly where he's going to play, and he's going to be special in that role. When it comes to everybody that's not on that sort of elite level, in order to get into the 6.7 to 6.9 grade range, you have to be able to do all three, like we said before. You have to have the back end, you have to have the intermediate man coverage ability, and you have to be able to play near the line of scrimmage, or else teams can scheme us. That's basically the reason why. If you can't do all three of those things, then on first and second down, we have somewhere for the, for the opposing offense to attack that's jumping out at them on the field. So that's kind of the reasoning there. And then we look at when you get to the lower level, it's not you have to be this or you have to be that. We have to understand which you are, but there's no there's nothing to say that inherently uh, a guy that when we bring out a third safety on the field is going to slide more into the, the back end role versus somebody who's going to play closer to the line of scrimmage. There's no inherent reason why one of those is more valuable than the other. It's the ability to do both 
that that really uh, separates at this position. Not to totally get where you're coming from. All right, final position here, uh, Matt, and that, and again, thank you so much for the time. Is the running back spot? I think you see this the same way I do. You guys have five running backs in your lower end starter category here, and you have Trey Benson. What I love is that these five running backs are all so different. Trey Benson's kind of your home run hitting speed guy. Audrey Gestime is your second guy that kind of power but shifty without that top end speed type of guy. Then you have Brooks out of Texas. You can do a little bit of everything. Shipley is your excellent passing down guy. And boy, is he elusive in small areas when he runs it. Then you have Blake Corum, who's kind of that, you know, miniature between the tackles runner who, again, doesn't have great top speed but makes people miss and is just an all-around good player. They're all so different, but you have them in the same grade category, which I would imagine would be kind of like a, a, a round two, round three type of situation. Uh, your thoughts on on that top of that running back class, and it's just – is it really just a matter of what flavor of ice cream you like? Yeah, there, there are so many running backs uh, that play that um, unless you get a really, really special talent, it's very hard to make the argument to be, to be running to draft these guys early. Um, I think they are all different flavors to a, to a different extent. Um, we like Benson probably at the top of the group, just because of the explosiveness, like you talked about, that's probably the most important trait of all the ones that you listed off there that, that each of these guys have. Uh, Estime is probably my favorite of these players to watch. Nyack guy, so I'm a homer as far as that goes. Um, but but generally, uh, I like the way he plays football. I, I really I, I think he's a he's a good football player, just not not ideally a third down player. Uh, I think currently in, in in the way that more of a guy that you're going to want to mix with somebody else. Um, but I think these are good players. I think that just like the receivers, the running backs are a victim of the the position, and you know for them it's a devaluation of the position that goes in along with having a glut of talent that's there. Um, you can find free agent running backs right now. If you need somebody to start uh, on Sunday, there are people that are out there that, that, that you can add. I think having a, somebody like one of these players, if you can get them in the third or fourth round, having that cost control player that you can, that you can count on that's super duper valuable, but um, it's really what, what makes it hard with running backs is that the the sort of replacement level, um, right? Like the wins over replacement, if you look at it that way, the replacement level from one running back to another, you, you're just not making that big a jump. And then I love it. You guys, I, I had to recount it twice. You have 21 running backs in your grading scale area, limited starter or multi-positional backup. And to me, Matt, that's got to be that rotational guy, right? He'll be the the second guy in a two-man split backfield. And my gosh, I think this shows you how many running backs are going to go in that, you know, late round three to round five area in this draft. You have a 21 players, more than any other position in that group. Yeah, a lot of teams that want to get a late round back this year, good news. There are going to be a lot of late round backs that go this year. Um, this could be the sort of year where, just like in a in a in a receiver draft, we've gotten to the point where you'll see more than 32 receivers drafted in an individual year. We could see a running back year like that this year, where I'm not betting on it early, right? They're not coming on the first day. Second day maybe a little trickle, but on day three, they're gonna be a bunch of these guys. And then even when we get into the the post-draft priority free agent type signing, you'll see some of these guys actually hoping not to get drafted in the seventh round so that they can pick their opportunity a, a little bit more. So, um, yeah, nature of that position these days. I know. It, it, I'm sure it's a lot different than when you first started scouting, um, you know, back when the running backs were going top five. Trey Benson, Cadillac Williams, right, back-to-back -back top five picks and that sort of thing. Very different. All right, Matt, tell all the folks, you already talked about SAS, what you guys do. Where can they find all your content? Where should they go to find it? Tell them everything they need to know. Yeah, definitely check out the 33rd Team website. That's at the 33rdteam.com. Uh, don't hate us too much for working with Mike Tannenbaum on that. Um, I promise he's not a bad, as bad a guy as he seems. No, I'm kidding. Um, in terms of SIS, you can find us probably most easily on Twitter at sportsinfo underscore SIS. Uh, my personal account at Matt Mano, M-A-T-T-M-A-N-O. Um, and look out for us. You can sign up for the Sports Info Solutions newsletter at sportsinfosolutions.com. And um, we're looking forward to another, another fun draft. And then, uh, can't wait to open the open the gifts uh, when they come out in, in August.
Yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. Matt, terrific. Thank you so much for the time, and let's do this again next year. And, you know, maybe this year we'll do a little uh, season preview with you, too. We haven't done that yet to kind of get your guys' take on what the season might look like. Yeah, I'd love to chat anytime. Awesome. Matt Maticharian from Sports Info Solutions, SIS. Thank you for joining us on the Giants Little Podcast. We'll see you next time, everybody. 